you're leveraging your medicine background to kind of invest in something that's related. And that's, that's where the beauty is, right? It's not just, you know, learning new knowledge, but also connecting the dots and leveraging what you already know, leveraging your background to kind of propel yourself forward and take others with you. And I know that you're doing a lot of the same stuff too. And, you know, this podcast, for example, what are we doing? We're sharing information. We're empowering people. We're starting conversations. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Immigrant Doctor Podcast. I have with me Dr. Amir Baluch. So for those of you who don't know him, he is actually an anesthesiologist in Dallas, and he also is uh, heavily involved in private equity. So he still actually works as an anesthesiologist right now. And in fact, he's on call right now as we're talking. Uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself and uh, we'll get into this amazing discussion that we're about to have with him. Welcome, Amir. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be on this podcast today and talk to your audience about some cool asset classes. So, yeah. So let's talk about. Let's start with what what got you into investing. I mean, you're you're an anesthesiologist and and you make uh, good money, right? So so what got you into investing? Well, you know, it started when I was a kid. I actually had a bunch of failures. So the first failure, which uh, is really poison to everybody's ear, but I got rejected by medical school the first time I applied. And my whole life I was thinking, well, you know, I get A's and everything, I'm top of my class, everything should be okay. But I did not get in the first time. So that made me rethink career choices in general. What if I never get in? And about one or two months after that, my dad, who was a doctor, internal medicine, he went bankrupt. And oh, wow. So uh, he didn't have a lot of savings and I would talk to him a little bit about investing, but he would never talk about it. And during this bankruptcy, I found out he really didn't save anything. He didn't have a retirement account. He didn't own real estate. He didn't diversify. So uh, that wasn't that wasn't a really good feeling when my whole family had to move to a one bedroom apartment and kind of start from scratch. And uh, all the employees left his clinic and things like that. You know, when you can't make payroll, it's hard to have employees work for free. And so I was thinking, what do I need to do to make sure this doesn't happen again to me or even anybody else, any of my colleagues or anything like that? So I became a voracious reader and I was talking to other people that were really successful. I'm trying to find out, you know, what is the magic formula to making it big in case I don't ever become a doctor? You know, how do people make money in this world. So I really just thought I was going to be a doctor and I, I really had the blinders on at that point. So that's what got me interested in investing actually back when I was 21. Yeah, I think you raise a very valid point, right? So your dad was a physician and there is there is this perception. And I mean, it, it it's true also to some extent that doctors do make good money. But despite that, he went through a bankruptcy. Despite that, despite having been a doctor, having studied for this long to become a physician and earning a good, good income, he still went through bankruptcy. And the fact that he didn't have this moat, this safety net to fall back on, kind of really had a big impact on you and your family in the way you were living. And I think it shaped the way, the way, you know, the direction that you took in the future. Right, right. It definitely faces to uh, force us to learn about investing and being frugal and what works and what doesn't work. And in the end, it was actually a good thing because if that didn't happen, I probably wouldn't know what I know now. <laughs> I'll probably just <laughs> be in the same boat as a lot of other people and just seeing reimbursement decline and not having any really good options. But, you know, luckily I surrounded myself with a lot of good mentors and, you know, throughout the years, I guess going to spend more than two decades now, just learned a lot about different asset classes, a lot of real estate, a lot of private equity, a lot of everything. So. Yeah. I think the other thing about what you're mentioning is that's so important is that when you start investing, it's more of a collaborative effort rather than a competition. That That is something that we see so often in medical industries, like one person is competing against the other. But but you mentioned getting these mentors, and I have had mentors. And it's, it's important to have other people who are a little further ahead in your journey to kind of hold your hand and get you to that level when you're investing, when you're getting started so that you learn from their mistakes and you kind of, you know, uh, proceed with caution, so to say. Right. And I think... Being a doctor doesn't help because if you're in the hospital, you're in your own clinic, 
you, it's your job to know everything. Like you call all the shots. So if you don't know the answer, that means nobody knows the answer. And that's how our mind is trained. So, and even if you're wrong, people will still listen to you and things will be okay. <laughs> like that's not really often. <laughs> if you remember in, in medical school and college, you know, a lot of times people don't understand what's going on, but they don't raise their hand. They're sometimes afraid to let people know what they don't know. So for example, if I say, what is private equity? Or if I ask somebody that's listening, what's the difference difference between private equity and venture? They probably don't know, but they're probably using these words in everyday conversation, but nobody has stopped to ask the question. And I'm sure with you people, um, you know, you might talk about cap rates with people. People really don't, I feel like people don't really understand cap rates until maybe the fifth time that it's explained to right, them. Right, right. It's like, but they just go, they just nod their head and they keep going and then they don't, they don't learn. And then they start, you know, making decisions based off of this lack of information. And then that's when people can get burned. So yeah, I'm I think that's, that's challenging because I think the way the world of medicine works is it's more of reprimanding rather than, you know, um, learning from somebody else. It's instead of saying, Oh, you don't know this. How do you not, how dare you not know this going to, well, if you don't know, that's okay. Um, let's, let's get to know this. And this is how you can learn, learn this, you know, whatever's going on. Um, and that's very different from, uh, from investing where you need to know all of this, it's, especially when money is involved and large sums of money is involved. Right. So, right, right. um, you know, for, for this reason, I've actually started, uh, I've created a very small course on my website and, uh, folks who are listening and watching this, um, if you go to my website, you can actually download that, uh, free video course and, uh, you can learn some basics of real estate because I'm investing in real estate. Having said that, we're not talking about real estate today because I know you you kind of have pivoted from real estate. But you know, I want to kind of dive into your journey of when you were going through your med school and you saw your dad, um, you know, going through this bankruptcy, uh, and you started learning about the process. I when you know when I started talking about uh, you know investing or I started thinking about investing, my first go to was the stock market. Uh, I'm just curious, what what did you do differently, or did you do the same thing? Well, you know what? I did the same thing. And I think I was 17 years old when I set up my first brokerage account and I bought a few mutual funds. And it was really because now that I look back at it, it's because it's ease of access. If you have a computer or a phone, even you could invest online and in public stocks. It's public. Anybody can access it. You don't need to be a credit investor or, you know, you're not going to get invited to a deal where minimum minimum investment is a million dollars right so, so right. you could put a hundred bucks or 50 bucks and then as i as i went through the years after the bankruptcy i learned one little fact that changed my life but the average millionaire makes their first million in real estate so then i went all in on real estate real estate real estate and luckily for me my best friend from college was the head of finance for a large private REIT in san antonio I think they have like five, 6,000 units in multifamily right now. So I would co-invest with them, even with my, uh, with my medical student loan money, I would actually get emergency <laughs> loan money and invest it into multifamily. And that was a pretty cool way for me to learn. That was back in 2005. I guess that's like, wow, that almost feels like 20 years ago. I guess like 18 years ago. <laughs> But then I kept, you know, I kept at it. And then in 2010, when I came to Dallas after finishing my anesthesia residency, I just want to get more involved. So I got my real estate license. Um, then a year later, I owned my own real estate brokerage so I could do fix and flips and do some transactional stuff. And I also joined a broker dealer as a registered rep. So for those people who don't know, basically a broker dealer they actually can sell securities and a security is whenever you pool money whenever there's two or more investors passively investing in a deal that's a security uh, so it could be two three people in one real estate deal that's a security that's what most people are familiar with uh, people call them syndications also so we did about 600 million in real estate there through that broker deal over four or five years we had hard money lending fund we had some private equity deals and uh, in 2015 was when I left to go off on my own. But that was pretty much my journey into just going all in, getting whatever licenses I could get, which doesn't mean 
you had to do that to become knowledgeable. That's just the way I did it. <laughs> so right, right. I was actually, and, and I, I'm guessing that you you went into this bro on this broker dealer route just so that you could grow your portfolio bigger and you could have an impact on more people because now you're you're like <laughs> you're leveraging other people's money and not not just leveraging other people's money. You're actually pooling in money from other people to help everybody grow and you know scale right. up their portfolio. Yes, when people when people found out I was I was doing anything real estate related, like within the first year I hit Dallas, they wanted to co-invest with me. I didn't really know what to do. I know I don't like to lose other people's money. So I was like, let me just work with these people that have amazing track record uh, of basically never losing investors money. And let me just work with these guys. And they paid me because I registered rep, you get paid. So I was getting paid to learn from some of the best in Dallas when it comes to multiple real estate asset classes. So, uh, you know, it's basically like doing another fellowship. If you guys want to put in the time, that's one way to do it. Another way, you know, just if people want to understand securities in general, the only, you know, real ways to get to illegally get commission, at least on raising money is registered rep with a broker dealer, or you could be an investment advisor through an RAA, which is a registered investment advisory. So RAA or BD, those are kind of the two routes that deal with willing and dealing in securities. And there are other ways you could get paid being a part of real estate transactions through exemptions. But I chose the that way. Doesn't mean it's right for everybody, but I learned a lot. Yeah, you, you chose the more treacherous way, just like a lot of physicians do, right? <laughs> we try yeah. to make everything more complicated than it should be. Right, but right. but I think, uh, but I, I understand when I know we had had this conversation before and I kind of understand why you went the route of becoming, you know, uh, registering with a broker dealer, which is definitely much more treacherous than actually, uh, you know, using the exemptions that SEC does offer. Uh, but but then you did exit from real estate and what made you exit from it in 2015? But that's when like, from what I've seen is like from 2015 to now is when a lot of the money has been made in real estate. Uh, yeah, I'll say yes and no. So uh, I've had access to CoStar, which is basically like MLS, but for commercial real estate, it's basically data right. mining. And then we saw cap rates coming down and then instead of looking, you know, the, the sponsors that we were working with, instead of looking at 20 deals to get one, they were looking at 100. And then I was looking at the cap rates. And I'm like, can these go lower than 5%? Like, that's kind of crazy. And then interest rates were really low. It's like, can interest rates get any lower? In the mm -hmm. back of my mind, I'm thinking if interest rates go higher from now, people buying now may get burned. And I didn't know when it was going to happen. So I slowly started exiting from my multifamily. I think the last one that I was uh, that I was owner in, we sold it in 2019. And then I just waited. I was just waiting for the crash. Uh, or I was waiting for interest rates to come up and then people to get shaky on their loans and can't refinance. And, uh, and I already knew who I was going to go after, actually, because on CoStar, there's some hacks to getting off market deals with CoStar. Like I can see who's gotten a loan in the last two or three years. They might have two or three years of variable interest rate construction yeah. only type loans. It's going to come up in two or three years. They, they're either going to sell or refinance. So I'm, I was already had my eye on some properties. And then I think COVID let it go for another three years, basically, you know, or another two years, you know, because government's not going to go up on interest rates when the economy is crashing. So right. maybe I'll I'm, I'm so glad that you're mentioning this because, you know, I did a I did an episode on market cycles and it's kind of similar to what, um, <laughs> you know, Howard Marks mentions in his book and similar to my understanding of the market. You knew that the market was <laughs> changing because of the compression, compressing cap rates and yeah. the interest rates being so low. And right. while you did not know for sure when it's going to change, and it took five years, so to say, from 2015 to 2020 um, or 2021, um, even actually longer than that, right? Because of COVID. So now 2022, <laughs> even though it took seven years uh, for it to kind of now start seeing that change, you didn't know when it would happen. It took seven right, years, right. but you kind of predicted it and you still exited at a point where you were making significant profit and you pivoted, you know, pivoted out of it. 
knowing fairly well that once it changes and once you start seeing that change in the market trends, that's when you might enter into the market again. So, you know, it kind of ties into the whole idea of a lot of times people talk about uh, time in the market is better than timing the market. That's true for, you know, if you're an average investor and you're not following the market and you're, you know, you have money that's just uh, kept away. But actually, if you are able to uh, time the market, uh, or well, let me. I don't want to say time the market because that's sort of like gambling. But at least predict or look at what the trends are showing you, right. and then and then make an educated decision. Again, nobody can know when the market's going to pivot and where the market's going to go. But it's just having those odds in your favor because of all the data that you're getting in. And then you were looking at the data from CoStar, um, seeing you know the cap rates compress and the interest rates being so low which made you make that education educated decision sure you did not make the profit that you would have made say you would have held the you know you would have held the asset for longer but you still made a a killing and you still made a significant profit that was valuable to you yeah and actually what you said is really important i want to keep talking about that where you know if somebody says something so eloquently like you know time in the market is better than timing the market. It sounds like something that was written like 2000 years ago on stone. But as doctors, you know, we're pretty good at critical thinking. You should use critical thinking on everything anybody says, right? It doesn't matter what guru is saying it on some Facebook post or, you know, you know, I mean, you got to kind of think about it. And, you know, now that I've basically transitioned from doing, from just uh, mainly focused on real estate to be, to being more like a private fund manager and multiple assets, which you're saying is even more important to me because as trends change, you know, I'm moving, uh, I'm creating funds in different asset classes to take um, to take advantage of those macroeconomic trends. So, like for example, interest rates are high. Where's the opportunity, right? Interest rates low. Where's the opportunity? You got to look at these things. If interest rates are high, and people are borrowing at eight or nine percent. I mean, I could have a lending fund and let's be on the lending side. If people don't, you know, if individuals don't want to borrow, okay, let's lend at a high rate, right? Because the rates right. are high. So, you know, or like if the stock market crashes, for example, the public stock market crashes. I know that one of the macroeconomic trends is that private equity trails behind by about six to nine months. So, which is why we're pretty heavy into private equity now. And we were before, so, but we're now even more into private equity. And along the same lines, I don't know if, uh, if everybody understands who Tiger 21 is. It's basically like a private group of people. You have to have um, basically liquid net worth 50 million to join right now. It used to be 10, I think now it's 50 million. It's basically like top 1% of net worth people, right? So they all get right. together and they share resources, but it's also public data, how they construct their portfolio. And every year it changes based on macroeconomic trends. And right now it just happens to be that their largest allocation is in private equity at 31%. So, uh, you know, cause they're seeing their, I mean, they have access to, you know, the best resources. They have chief investment officers managing family offices, right? They could right. pay for all the data. They probably have quarter million dollars a year just spent on subscriptions for data so they can make decisions, right? So if you just, you want to do a little shortcut, just kind of look at what they're doing and just know that there's a lot of data behind that decision, right? So right. But it's cool. Look at those macroeconomic trends and don't just think about these black and white, hard and fast rules, you know, that, that maybe somebody says on some Facebook post. And, you know, by the time it hits <laughs> Facebook and by the time people start talking about a trend, it's already too late to get right, into that right. trend. It is. It is like, especially if you look at anything like crypto, somebody just made, if everybody's making a lot of money in crypto, okay, you missed the boat. It's, it doesn't mean it's time to jump in right now. Crypto is right. low. It was sent at 15, 20,000. Where's the, where's the headlines? Why are not people buying like crazy? So I feel right. like I was really one of the few people buying and people were making fun of me when it was 15, 20,000. And now like, I think it jumped to 30,000, which was pretty predictable when the SVB bank collapse happened. You know, people are going right. to be scared when they're scared uh, about cash. They're going to be moving to things that hedge against inflation. So, right. you know, that's a pretty predictable uh, economic trend. If people were keeping up with that, they could have made a quick 30% in a month. 
And, you know, it, it's also the understanding that um, investing psychology is sort of counterintuitive or opposite of general psychology when there's fear about a particular asset class that's actually, and this is a phenomenal what this guy said in his book was like, that's actually the time when you're, when it's probably the safest to invest in that asset class because nobody else is buying and you're going to get a deep, deep right, discount right. on that asset. And it's, it's just mastering your mind at that point in time and yes. kind of, uh, you know, focusing on it. But let's talk about private equity because I think uh, that's the, that's a shift. Now, I, I, you know, I understand how you kind of looked at it and I, I deeply respect, you know, the way you kind of pivoted from, from real estate into private equity. That it's interesting that you mentioned about, you know, uh, looking at CoStar and looking at when the loans are coming due and what, what uh, you know, asset classes, what, uh, what properties to earmark. It's so funny because I literally had this discussion with my my partner a few days ago about oh. you know looking at looking at this using the same strategy to kind of see okay these are the things that are coming these are the products that are coming out in the market now and or are you know about to come out and we should probably focus on those assets um but you know pivoting to pivoting to private equity um how did you kind of decide that that was the space that you wanted to be in so I always had an interest in business. In fact, I've started probably at least 15 different businesses and either sold them off or just let them fizzle away or, you know, whether it was my medical spa or I was flipping used cars, used watches. I've done all kinds of things, a lot of e-commerce stuff too. <clears throat> and I know that a lot of money is made in private equity. So, uh, I was like, how do I get into this and learn a little bit more? And so if I got into, and first of all, I guess, let me define what private equity is. So you have the public market, which everybody's familiar with. Think of almost everything else as private equity to an extent. Okay. These are private, privately owned businesses and under private equity, you have a couple of different categories. So for example, hedge funds fall under private equity and it gets even more complex because some hedge funds can also be short, long, and public equity. So it gets a little bit tricky. Venture capital is private equity, but more like startups, usually companies smaller than 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, which that's the that's where I kind of, I kind of play in the biotech world. The biotech is just one industry inside private equity. You also can have leveraged buyouts. I'm sure every doctor that's listening has seen one of their friends get bought out by a large corporation, right? So leverage buyouts uh, and doing these roll-ups, that's considered private equity as well. So and the list goes on and on. Any type of private business activity is private equity. And then you have all these different categories. So so uh, another, another thing that I looked at, besides just saying that private equity was where a lot of money is made. In fact, if you just threw darts at biotech and didn't follow any investment advice, your IRR is probably 27%. That's pretty much wow. what it is. If you just spray and pray over the last two decades, it's 27%. So, no, but I was thinking, okay, well, let me reverse engineer failure and let's see what we can avoid. So it just happens that in private equity and for startups in general, 42% of the reason they fail is because they don't have product market fit. So imagine if some med tech thing comes in, or let's say, you know, or uh, some new pharmaceutical drug, and somebody's gonna push their money behind it, who knows better whether end users will use it or not and the, the effect than doctors. So for example, I know there was one uh, emergency medicine drug, some sed uh, sedative drug for the ER, this guy showed me a pitch deck, and it made sense to me. It's like, okay, I guess, you know, it's cheaper, it works like this, and okay, got it. Um, I just called up three of my ER doctors like, yeah, we will never use that. <laughs> we're gonna stick with this. Like we're just not going to. And there's another one where, like, <clears throat> I guess pre prevent aspiration from EGDs. There's some little plastic tool you could put on there. But the chance of aspiration from an EGD is pretty small. I know this because I do anesthesia for EGDs. Like if right. somebody's high aspiration risk, I mean, within five seconds of them being asleep, you have the scope in their esophagus on suction right? Why do we need some extra device that adds bulk, right? right? There's no prime market fit. 
So I, I, uh, I'm, I sit on a couple uh, advisory boards for companies. So I came in on this meeting. I'm like, guys, just scrap this thing. It's not going to work. I don't even call anybody else just to, like scrap it. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> but then we have other things that make a lot of sense. So for example, one of our shining star companies just hit $5 billion valuation. We invested a year and a half ago, $87 million valuation, but it's basically like the liquid biopsy for cancer diagno diagnostics. Well, if you want to screen yourself for cancer, what are you going to do? Colonoscopy, breast biopsies, mammographies, whatever it is, right? What if there's a blood test that was so accurate and the filter was uh, so solid that it would pick up in situ tumors, even at, even if a small few amount of cells get into the bloodstream, right? Because nobody, basically people die of METs, right? You usually don't die from right. the primary tumor. This thing is catching catching insight to tumors before there's actually mets. Uh, so that's a game changer. We knew it was a game changer. We knew that the managers had an amazing track record. Family offices backed it. They're not going to run out of cash. Um, right. Came in at a good valuation. And then they also had a breakthrough last year. Mm -hmm. Boom, we're like at 5 billion, right? So everything made sense. The product market fit. Uh, the capital backing was solid. There's a path to exit. CPT codes are there. These are things doctors know how to exist if you're going to make money off of some med tech, right? Like what if CPT, yeah. CPT codes aren't there? We already know as doctors, hey, it's not easy to get some new CPT codes, right? So in fact, that was one of the questions I asked when he told me CPT codes already existed. We doubled down. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that was like a big headache for me if it didn't have CPT codes. So so now, you know, imagine if 42% of failure is gone just because I'm connected to a bunch of doctors. I mean, you're, you basically almost mathematically have doubled your rate of success. So the average- Yeah, I love it. I love it. I mean, you're leveraging your medicine background to kind of invest in something that's related. And that's, that's where right. the beauty is, right? It's not just not just using, uh, you know, learning new knowledge, but also connecting the dots and leveraging what you already know, right. leveraging your background to kind of propel yourself forward and take others with you. Right, right. And I know that you're doing a lot of the same stuff too. And, you know, this podcast, for example, what are we doing? We're sharing information, we're empowering people, we're starting conversations, because all this investing, you shouldn't be investing uh, like an island. And I know there's some doctor, they want to do their own day trading, like, oh, I'm better than every other fund manager, you know, even though the average fund manager's whole goal is beat S&P 500 by one or 2%, right? They right. think they spend all this time, and they're not valuing their time, you know, but they spend all this time, maybe they'll do 20% more of the stock market. And 98% of the time, statistically, 98% of the time, you're not going to beat the S&P 500. But yeah, 2% of doctors day trading, probably beating S&P, but the other 98% should probably double down on their clinic work or do something else. So right, right. definitely, definitely, you know, don't invest by yourself and use some knowledge that you have and connections you have to make better invest investments and talk to other doctors. So, so how can people get involved with private equity? I mean, like, I understand that part of the, you know, one way is to kind of collaborate with other people who are, who have present these opportunities, but, but how did you end up being say on the advisory board of these companies to uh, be in that position to, to give your advice and to bring more capital to these deals? Uh, so it was a couple different reasons. Definitely. They liked the fact that I could bring capital to them if I wanted to. And sometimes I don't, depending on the deal. Just having medical insight and medical resources, you know, if you're not a doctor, it's hard to get a doctor on the phone. I could probably call up any doctor in the nation. I'll probably get a phone call back the same day, right? So if it, right. if if they really need some analysis from an expert in the physician field, if I can't take care of that question myself at my level, you know, I'll phone a friend, you know, like on that game show, I forgot the name, but <laughs> who wants to be a millionaire? You could, you could do like the hotline and call somebody. Right. And then also with my business background and having the background of the broker dealer and understanding real due diligence and underwriting and things like that, I could even help underwrite some pro formas and, you know, somebody comes in with a deal and this pro forma is off. I'm like, look guys, this doesn't even make any sense. Like just trash this idea. So I feel like sometimes I'd get paid just to say no a lot, but 
but it works and it doesn't hurt them to have another opinion, right? So uh, in fact, other doctors, if there's something, if that's something you want to look into doing, see if you can be part of a strategic advisory board and at least give your clinical knowledge. There's more than one way to monetize your clinical knowledge. So that's one way to do it. Now, if you have the passive investment mindset, you definitely want to partner with people that are either heavy hitters themselves and have successful exits or that are associated with people that have successful exits, which one of my criteria in my first biotech fund in 2018 was we didn't want to invest in any company where the C-suite did not have an exit in that industry. And so about only maybe 15, 20% of the companies we invested in did not meet that criteria. But there's some other criteria which made it overwhelming yes for us to jump in. But 80% of the time, I'm not talking to anybody where this is their first rodeo. Uh, so if you're trying to get into private equity, don't, you know, I wouldn't back somebody that's just doing it for the first time. You got to work with somebody that's been there, done that. And then also, just like you're using CoStar, there are other things you can do too, like pitch book or prequin, other things like that. Like if I want to, it costs a little bit of money, it's like 25 grand a year. But if you really want to get into it, you know, I could track everything Sequoia Capital is doing. I know what Bain Capital is doing, you know. And then I also surround myself with people that are experts in MA. So if a deal comes in, I'm like, hey, does this make sense? Does this exit multiple make sense or not? So uh, that's pretty much some criteria you'd want to probably take a look at if you want to get involved with private equity. Yeah, and I think the important thing is that um, what you're doing now is actually a culmination of what almost two decades of investing and almost two decades of knowledge right. that you've had. Right, right? right. So it's even though it may look like it's it's all of you know these five billion dollar exits and and you know these multiple millions of dollars of exits that you've had in real estate, but it took a while to get there. And right. and investing is a long game. It you know a lot of times what ends up happening and it happens to me as well. You go on social media, you will see somebody posting their success, and you often undermine or don't recognize the long journey that they've had to get there. So. Um, you know, I've had, I've, I've have had people talk to me and they're like, we want to, you know, say they want to exit out of medicine. And then I tell them it's not going to happen next year, probably, right, you know, right. it's it may happen over a few years, but it's a long game. You have to keep at it before you can, you know, even decide to pivot into something else. And if you just think about it, who out there has a six figure job, you got doctors, engineers, attorneys, right? How long did that take? And for most doctors, they put in at least about a dozen years. <laughs> and even right. then, you're still learning after that. And I'm, right. I'm like 12 years in the private practice, and I still learn a few things every now and then. So it's basically never-ending learning. And you, my brother, who I, I pulled him out of his MBA courses, he runs our real estate development company. I told him, look, this is going to be a long time. Like We're talking at least five or 10 years before you could you could really run things on your own. And but now we're in year 12 and now it's worth it. And, and if you talk to anybody in real estate, actually, that's a expert sponsor, for example, they've got probably a couple of decades of experience under their belt. Like if they really, they, they, you have to usually you have to go through at least one market cycle. Right. And so if market cycle is 10 to 15 years, you need to be in that industry for about 10 to 15 years to see all the ups and downs and to see how people uh, acclimate it to those environments. Yeah, and I want to I want to point out to the fact that you know you had mentioned this earlier also that a lot of people who are starting new like me <clears throat> I'm relatively new to this space right I haven't gone through a full market cycle but that doesn't mean I'm not going to get people on my team who haven't gone through that full market right. cycle it's a collaborative effort right. and I think that's the way that's the way everybody grows for example say somebody wants to start in private equity right now they may not have gone through a previous market cycle but if they work on or they they work off of the experience that somebody else has had and in a in a in a downturn or in a in in the bad market well there's no bad market cycle but you know when there's a there's a downturn in the market it gives them a different perspective it gives them different strategies to work with and i'll give you an example of uh, you know what i did to kind of um to understand uh, how to pivot and how to learn from what was changing I understood traditional financing 
uh, fairly well for multifamily. And this was last year uh, when I was, you know, when I was investing. And I saw that the interest rates are rising. And I asked myself this question, well, what were the people in 1970s doing? Because they've been investing in real estate since forever. We've right. been investing in real estate forever. But what were they doing when the interest, interest rates were super high? So I did not understand creative financing at that point in time. It was new to me. So I went and sought out people who could teach me creative financing. I went and sought out people who understood how to take advantage of that situation. Now, I'm relatively new to this industry, but getting that knowledge and getting that information helps me make better decisions and helps you know people who are more experienced than me are helping pull me up to that level where I am more equipped with these tools to offset any downturn that comes into the market. Right, right. It's it's a little bit sometimes the opposite of medicine where sometimes the doctors, the hero in this business world, real estate world, it's about the team. So uh, and it's usually not just one person carrying the team, yet the whole team has to be working together and they kind of work in complementary fashion. So it's hard to be an expert at everything, but you do need to have different types of experts in there you know one person might might be expert at the financial structure one person mm -hmm. at the management aspect of it so one person on the r d so i think that's some, probably one of the most important things that we're getting through to people today is that this is investing is a team sport it's not a one-on-one a -on -one type thing right and even say you know say for example for private equity i mean you got into it 2015 2016 um when you got into it you hadn't gone through the full market cycle yourself right, right? Exactly. and you would have had other mentors guiding you and pulling you up and having you know you're leveraging their experience of and of a market cycle to get that knowledge and get you started yes this is that's exactly what i did <laughs> so you know cuz going in i don't want to go in blind so let me let me borrow somebody's knowledge that's been there, done that. So that's really was the well, key. Another reason they recommended biotech too. They said, hey, Amir, look at all the industries. You know, first biotech is killing it. And then you've got the medical background. So this makes sense for you. So well, let's let's talk about that QR code behind you. What's what's the story with that? Oh, this one, you know, if people just want a, a quick primer on alternative assets and private equity. You can just scan this thing right here behind my head. Here, I'll move out of the way. <laughs> so you just click on that thing and we'll send you a little ebook. It's like 20, 30 pages. You'll probably end up with more questions than answers, but at least get your mind thinking. And then you start asking other people's questions, which is good. Now you're learning. Uh, so that's pretty much what that is. And if you're not watching the video, you can just go to baluchcapital.com and just say that you you heard us on the podcast here today and we could send it over that way too. Great, great. And uh, so I think that's how people can get in touch with you. And folks, if you want to learn a bit about real estate, just understand the basics of how to invest in real estate, what real estate really is. Uh, you can go to theimmigrantdoctor.com and uh, I have created a free video course for you. It's a very small introductory course, kind of gets you started um, and gets your you know mental wheels rolling about uh, about real estate and gets you thinking in that direction. Well, any parting thoughts or any parting words, Amir? Huh. Well, actually, if you're listening to this, that's great that you're taking that first step of education and it doesn't stop here. I definitely take a look at these free video courses. There's so much free information out there. You kind of owe it to yourself to educate yourself so you can make some educated decisions. So that's what this is all about. So if you guys got any questions about anything, reach out to either one of us and let's get the education ball rolling. Well, thank you so much, Amir, for joining me today and uh, you know, talking about private equity. We'll probably have you again on the show for uh, some more discussions about other, other asset classes that we can invest in. I know you are fairly experienced on this and I think uh, we'll have you back on the show. Thank you so much again. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Touch you later.